Um, as a chancellor of, uh, of the Academy, I'm Monsignor Pegoraro, with Laura Palazzani, she's a member of the board. Uh, welcome to everybody, benvenuti a tutti. Benvenuti a tutti i membri presenti. Welcome to all members present uh, for this uh, uh, General Assembly workshop. Welcome uh, ai membri che sono online. We have some members that for some problems we are not able to come. E quindi un benvenuto a tutti i membri collegati e un saluto a tutti i partecipanti che sono circa 400 non membri dell'Accademia ma collegati online per questo interessante workshop che voi conoscete già come titolo Converging on the Person Emerging Technologies for the Common Good. E benvenuti e grazie a tutti gli speakers che sono già presenti e che offriranno il loro contributo importante per affrontare un tema così complesso e urgente come il Papa ha ricordato questa mattina. Cedo allora la parola a Sua Eccellenza l'Arcivescovo Vincenzo Paglia, Presidente della Pontificia Accademia per la Vita, per il suo discorso introduttivo a questo workshop. Grazie caro Don Renzo e buongiorno a tutti, a voi qui che siete in presenza e agli altri 400 almeno collegati online. Io mi permetto di chiamarvi cari amiche e cari amici, non perché il nuovo titolo concessomi questa mattina di Enfant Terrible della Curia, lo dico perché ha un sapore evangelico essere chiamati amici e amiche e con questo sapore io vorrei vivere questi nostri giorni. C'è un giusto entusiasmo nel ritrovarci in presenza dopo gli anni della pandemia e questo dà un calore particolare proprio per il bisogno che noi abbiamo di quelle relazioni dirette, immediate e non virtuali di cui Papa Francesco anche questa mattina ci parlava. Insomma, io ai membri dell'Accademia li voglio vedere e li voglio sentire. Non mi basta la presenza online. Quindi davvero benvenuti. Il tema che stiamo affrontando eh, comporta un insieme di questioni di cui si sente parlare in modo sempre più diffuso anche in Italia e non solo, sia in ambienti accademici, e di questo voi ovviamente ne siete ben consapevoli, ma anche negli organi di stampa, anche quelli più popolari. Per questo ci sentiamo particolarmente come dire, coinvolti in queste nostre giornate per affrontare un tema come questo. Non è mio compito ovviamente approfondire le tematiche che spettano a noi. Io vorrei semplicemente indicare alcune coordinate sulle quali si collocano diversi degli interrogativi principali che ci troviamo di fronte. Il primo, la prima, è il rapporto tra conoscenza e responsabilità. Parto proprio dall'ultimo punto richiamato dal Papa. Già negli anni scorsi abbiamo cercato di lavorare in questa direzione parlando di bioetica globale, di macchine automatiche, robot, di algoritmi, intelligenza artificiale e di salute pubblica in tempo di pandemia. Il Papa oggi ha nuovamente sottolineato la necessità di adottare un orizzonte ampio e flessibile per decifrare l'interfacciarsi dei nuovi fenomeni. L'effetto congiunto della loro interazione, lo sottolineava bene il Papa, è superiore alle parti. L'interconnessione perciò chiede un approccio alla complessità poliedrica dell'insieme 
che impone un deciso avanzamento verso un approccio conoscitivo transdisciplinare. Ed ecco perché anche nei membri dell'Accademia abbiamo voluto che ci fossero presenti diverse branche delle scienze, non solo quelle mediche, ma anche quelle bibliche, anche quelle dell'economia, perché tu si tiene. E questa è la grande sfida che viene affidata. Questa attenzione alle modalità con cui apprendiamo e conosciamo la realtà, peraltro, non è un discorso solo teorico, metodologico, epistemologico, ma una profonda rilevanza etica. Tanto maggiore quanto più i processi della conoscenza scientifica e gli sviluppi dell'evoluzione tecnica riguardano direttamente le stesse facoltà di conoscere, di apprendere, di sentire, di volere, di valutare e di decidere. Il Papa parlava di essere attenti alla velocità con cui tutto questo avviene. Dal modo in cui conosciamo dipende anche l'identificazione dei luoghi della nostra responsabilità che continuano a dilatarsi grazie a tecnologie sempre più potenti. Nello studiare e nel conoscere i fenomeni della natura e della società non va perciò trascurata la riflessione critica sulle categorie di pensiero con cui diamo loro forma. È oggi quanto mai necessaria una comunicazione tra le discipline per scongiurare il rischio di... Sto citando il Papa, il rischio che un processo scientifico venga considerato l'unico approccio possibile per comprendere un aspetto della vita, della società e del mondo. Invece, un ricercatore che avanza fruttuosamente nella sua analisi ed è anche disposto a riconoscere altre dimensioni della realtà che indaga, grazie al lavoro di altre scienze e altri saperi, si apre a conoscere la realtà in maniera più integra e piena, sempre Papa Francesco, in Fratelli Tutti. Per fare un esempio che riguarda i temi di cui ci occupiamo, pensiamo ai diversi modi di comprendere la malattia e la salute. Essi dipendono dal tipo di scienze di cui ci serviamo. Se trascuriamo l'ambiente, la società, l'economia e la cultura, saremo spinti a dare solo risposte medico biologiche. Ma la pandemia ci ha insegnato quanto tale prospettiva sia insufficiente. Per questo si è parlato anche di sindemia, per indicare la molteplicità di dimensioni che hanno interagito nella diffusione del contagio. I determinanti della salute o della malattia richiedono un approccio ben più articolato per essere efficacemente compresi e responsabilmente gestiti. Le tecnologie emergenti e convergenti sfidano i nostri atteggiamenti mentali e il modo con cui il nostro sapere è organizzato. E si porta innanzitutto allo scoperto il collegamento tra saperi e tra diversi tipi di tecnologie. Ma a un livello più fondamentale mettono in luce con particolare forza la reciproca interazione tra l'essere umano e l'ambiente. Ogni cambiamento dell'uno retroagisce sull'altro, per cui essi evolvono sempre insieme. Trasformare l'ambiente nelle sue molteplici dimensioni naturali, culturali, tecnologiche, significa sempre anche trasformare noi stessi. Dobbiamo considerare più attentamente questi aspetti per tenere meglio conto della complessità dei fenomeni ed evitare classificazioni astratte tra personale e artificiale, tra umano e tecnologico, tra diverse forme viventi della biosfera. Solo in questo modo potremmo impostare una riflessione che ci permetta di comprendere e sviluppare un rapporto con le macchine che non segua, magari surrettiziamente, 
la logica della sostituzione dell'uomo da parte della macchina, ma piuttosto quella di una effettiva cooperazione che mette capo all'umano. La seconda direzione è quella del rapporto tra persona e comunità. Un simile rapporto di muta implicazione vale anche per l'interrogativo che orienta la riflessione di questi giorni, richiamato dal titolo del nostro workshop dal riferimento al bene comune, un tema a mio avviso particolarmente importante sul quale tutte le scienze sono chiamate a riflettere, tutte, nessuna esclusa, chiesa compresa, cioè il rapporto tra individuo e comunità. Anche qui si tratta di superare ogni impostazione dualistica, occorre evitare una prospettiva che contrappone interesse generale e diritti individuali, come se la promozione dell'uno andasse a scapito degli altri. La vita, la via, è piuttosto quella di pensarli e promuoverli insieme, nella consapevolezza che si sostengono reciprocamente. Non esiste solo l'io, non esiste solo il noi, esistiamo assieme. Questo vale non solo in termini di qualità delle cure e di efficacia dei sistemi sanitari, ma anche nella pratica stessa del consenso informato che non può essere considerato solo come espressione della libertà del singolo, ma anche del legame sociale. Questo nesso indissociabile implica l'attenta valutazione delle condizioni pratiche di carattere intersoggettivo che definiscono da un lato il mondo effettivo e affettivo del singolo individuo e dall'altro chiamano in causa la responsabilità etica e di sostegno della comunità civile. Del resto la salute stessa si manifesta sempre più come uno dei beni comuni fondamentali che nessuno può salvaguardare da solo. Richiede infatti un impegno condiviso per essere promossa e tutelata. Si tratta dunque di, di elaborare una nozione di bene comune che non si limiti a considerarlo come somma degli interessi individuali in senso utilitarista, ma come condizione in cui tutti, nessuno escluso, possono realizzare se stessi. Mi verrebbe da dire che non è più possibile affermare come spesso si dice, che la mia libertà finisce dove inizia la tua. Questo non è più vero. Siamo tutti collegati. Non esiste la mia libertà senza anche la tua. E questo per me è importante perché deve sconfiggere un topos della mentalità comune che è difficilissimo da scardinare. Insomma, è indispensabile una comprensione della reciprocità non solo nei rapporti interpersonali ma anche di ciascuno dei confronti della società, della società come luogo di una convivenza solidale. Senza questo riferimento costitutivo al bene comune verrà eroso, a mio avviso, quel patrimonio di fiducia che sta alla base di ogni convivenza umana e di ogni forma di amicizia sociale di cui manda l'enciclica Fratelli Tutti al numero 168 e a cui anche il mondo scientifico è chiamato a contribuire. Il terzo filone di interrogativi indaga, e sono l'ultimo, alla fine, indaga sul contributo che come credenti possiamo fornire al dibattito su questi argomenti. Il Papa ci ha ricordato questa mattina come sia nostro compito discernere come il Vangelo può essere lievito che custodisce e promuove l'umano sul piano personale e comunitario su queste frontiere. L'esperienza religiosa in ambito cristiano ci offre un orizzonte di significato che coniuga la trascendenza dell'umano, sia del creato, 
è l'immanenza del divino che noi cristiano chiamiamo incarnazione. La prima, quella del creato, ci ricorda che la nostra origine ci precede e la nostra destinazione va oltre il confine del tempo. La seconda, l'incarnazione, ci rivela che il Signore Gesù assume e redime il tutto della condizione umana. In questo quadro siamo chiamati a contribuire con mediazioni concettuali che non temano di avvalersi delle risorse dei saperi contemporanei, inclusa la filosofia, sia per approfondire la comprensione delle esperienze fondamentali che sono comuni a tutti gli esseri umani, sia per rendere comunicabili e argomentabili le risorse del significato che la rivelazione e la tradizione ci offrono. Si tratta, insomma, di abitare la tensione insuperabile che si instaura tra diverse polarità. Da una parte la logica scientifico-tecnologica che intende il mondo come riserva di materiali disponibili, dall'altra il desiderio di riconoscerlo nel suo darsi spontaneo come portatore di vita e di senso. Una tensione che si manifesta in tutti i percorsi e le fasi in cui la vita si svolge, dalla nascita alla morte. L'apertura della coscienza religiosa alla trascendenza potrà essere sviluppata come uno stimolo che alimenta la fiducia nell'atto creatore di Dio a favore della sua creazione. La legittima esigenza di sperimentare nuove possibilità non giustifica in nessun modo tecniche dannose per la dignità dell'essere umano oppure orientate a sviluppare il progetto delirante del suo totale controllo. Trovare le vie per proteggere la prima e arginare il secondo è il compito di una ricerca umana degna di questo nome, portata avanti con rigore e onestà intellettuale. Come credenti siamo chiamati ad una vigilanza del tutto speciale sul dramma delle nuove tecnologie impiegate al servizio di operazioni distruttive sempre più ampie e sofisticate. Quanto sta avvenendo su numerosi fronti di guerra ce lo ripete con sempre maggiore forza. Ci stiamo approssimando all'anniversario dell'inizio della guerra in Ucraina con l'invasione tragica della Russia. Non possiamo accontentarci di denunciare solo gli orrori. Siamo chiamati a fare tutto il possibile perché la guerra termini e subito. Profitto per dare a tutti voi saluti da parte di due nostri accademici, il professor Boico e il professor Luzivan Ucraini, che ci salutano, sono rimasti in Ucraina, mentre è potuta venire con noi Sor Giustina. Non la vedo, l'ho vista prima. Noi speriamo che si possa trovare presto un accordo per il cessato del fuoco. Certo, mentre noi stiamo parlando delle nuove tecnologie emergenti e convergenti, dobbiamo provare spavento e orrore per i miliardi che si stanno spendendo e che sono previsti per le armi. Cifre inimmaginabili. E alcuni le giustificano. Io credo che questa nostra Accademia non possa sentire lo sdegno per quello che sta accadendo. C'è una pigrizia, a mio modesto avviso, e me lo fa dire la mia piccolissima esperienza in luoghi di conflitto, che è molto facile ricorrere alle armi, è molto più difficile riuscire a far parlare i contendenti, ma va fatto, va fatto, perché quando riescono a parlare e noi dobbiamo fare del tutto per farli parlare, perché la parola è più forte dei cannoni, 
ecco questo dovremmo farlo. La scienza, in questo caso mi auguro che aiuti sempre più tutti noi a impegnarci per lo sviluppo della fraternità e della solidarietà. E faccio mie le parole del Papa ad una ONG nel mese di dicembre, usare le armi per risolvere i conflitti è segno di debolezza e di fragilità. Negoziare, procedere nella mediazione e avviare la conciliazione richiede coraggio. E permettetemi di dirvi un mio piccolo coraggio. Lo dico perché non perché voglio vantarmi, perché lo sento legato. Nelle scorse settimane io mi sono recato in Kosovo, nei Balcani, a parlare con i miei amici del Kosovo e con i miei amici serbi a Belgrado per evitare quel che sta accadendo in Ucraina. E io sono testimone della forza, delle parole e della fiducia che può essere creata anche in mezzo a alle tempeste più difficili. Vi dico questo perché chiedo a voi una preghiera anche per questo, ma io vorrei che la, tutta l'Accademia fosse convinta e determinata a sentire la responsabilità di questi nostri giorni perché la scienza deve essere al servizio della pace e della fraternità perché questo è il sogno di Dio sul mondo e anche il nostro. Grazie. Grazie Presidente, veramente un'introduzione splendida che ci aiuta a entrare in un argomento molto complesso. Una parola, l'espressione tecnologie convergenti e emergenti nasce nel 2002, siamo a poco più di vent'anni, ma ancora dobbiamo riflettere sugli aspetti etici e antropologici. E sicuramente questa conferenza, che vede tutti gli aspetti scientifici, etici e giuridici, ci aiuterà a fare chiarezza su questo tema. And I have the privilege and the honor to introduce you Professor Rogers Strand, that will give uh, the opening lecture on the ethical issues of converging technologies. He is professor at the Center for the Study of the Sciences and Humanities and Center for Cancer Biomarkers at University of Bergen in Norway. He is adjunct professor at the Department of Biotechnology and Food Science, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He is co-director at the European Center for Governance in Complexity. And I remember the wonderful report, uh, the Bergen report on emerging technologies and converging technologies that uh, brought uh, for the Bioethics Committee at the Council of Europe. And I think that report signed a very important step in the European discussion on converging technologies. So thank you for accepting the invitation of the Pontifical Academy for Life. And uh, um, a, a very technical question. After the, uh, re the, the, the opening lecture, we will have a discussion, a very brief discussion. So you can write uh, your question in this question form, a very brief question. And then also on the chat for the one who are connected online, you can write a very brief question and then we will have together a discussion. Yes, in Italian, English, French and Spanish, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction <clears throat> and for this honor to speak at this wonderful workshop. I'll just check that the slides before I start. Science is human practice and culture. Technologies are developed by humans and for human use. On the face of it, one might think that scientific knowledge and technological innovations by themselves would converge on human purposes, by themselves emerge for the common good. 
Whether they actually do, however, is a complex and contested issue with extensive ramifications. Let me express my gratitude to the Academy for organizing this workshop and throughout the years devoting attention to such issues which are so difficult, so important, and for reasons that I shall return to, so poorly addressed in modern institutions. I am honored by the invitation to take part in this workshop and learn from its distinguished speakers and participants, and humbled by the opportunity to try myself to contribute to the exchange with this opening lecture. I shall outline some specific issues that surround converging technologies and have a call for ethical attention. My main objective, however, is to show that such issues are linked to structural features of contemporary modern societies and should be addressed as such. Neither science nor technology emerges in a vacuum, but is co-produced with the society in which it takes place. That is, science and technology shape and are shaped by other institutions and practices, such as those of politics and economics. The ethical issues of converging technologies are entangled with the political economy of technoscience, with political agendas of innovation and economic growth, and with market forces and ideologies and cultures of materialism and consumerism. More fundamentally, especially because converging technologies bear special promise of application on human bodies and minds, and not just inanimate matter, the ethical issues are entangled with the problem of the objectivation of man. More precisely, in the words of Laudato Si, the basic problem goes even deeper. It is the way that humanity has taken up technology and its development according to an undifferentiated and one-dimensional paradigm. This paradigm exalts the concept of a subject who, using logical and rational procedures, progressively approaches and gains control over an external object." Unquote. The insight formulated in this passage is crystal clear and yet quite abstract. I shall attempt to illustrate it with examples from the world of converging technologies and in all modesty put forth for discussion my own provisional thoughts on how to deal with the ethical issues from my perspective as a scholar and practitioner of science and technology studies. What are then converging technologies and their ethical issues in concrete terms? The term converging technologies denotes a set of technoscientific domains and their material and immaterial outcomes. This set typically includes biotechnology and molecular life science, including systems and synthetic biology, then also nanotechnology, informatics, and information and communication technologies, or ICTs, neurotechnology and cognitive science, and sometimes robotics and mechatronics. The idea of convergence relates to technological applications that cross these domains, but also to the scientific ambition of connecting and integrating the underlying scientific bodies of knowledge. Often, the integration is envisaged in terms of reductionism, notably by reducing biological, medical, and anthropological phenomena to the physico-chemical descriptions and explanations. Sometimes, the term converging technologies is supplemented or substituted by the term emerging technologies, a synonym that perhaps carries a little less of the ontological and ideological baggage. It is useful to know that the term converging technologies mainly belongs to the realms of research and innovation policy. Hardly any universities have departments or centers of converging technologies. Few experts would call themselves converging technologists. This was and is mainly a policy term and a term that belongs to discussions about how to support, fund, regulate, and govern certain fields of research. Indeed, the term converging technologies originated in a discourse about public funding of technoscientific research, how much money should be invested, on what, and why. It was a promissory type of discourse that focused on the potential opportunities provided by such a technological trajectory. The term came into prominence with the United States National Science Foundation Workshop Report 
edited by Mihail Rocco and William Bainbridge in 2002, which we see on the screen here, and the work surrounding this initiative. In this report and elsewhere, Rocco and Bainbridge made explicit transhumanist arguments in favor of upscaling funding on converging technologies with the aim of, and I quote, improving human performance. In their writings, they envisioned what they called a new renaissance, whereby the human species could improve itself, get new organs, new senses, possibly even connect brains and machines to arrive at a common consciousness, and ultimately eradicate war and violence by technologically modifying our species to become morally superior beings. What these arguably extreme visions illustrate is that the conceptual content of converging technologies includes visions and imaginations of future science and technology. Converging technology is, in Harvard scholar Sheila Jastanov's sense, a socio-technical imaginary. It's a shared vision of a future scientific, technological, and social order. It is quite common that such imaginaries have a strong promissory character. At the same time, if we look at the original 500 pages long National Science Foundation report from 2002, most of the contributions are quite different from the extreme ideological claims just mentioned. What they envision has more the character of piecemeal improvements, such as new and better prosthetics for disabled people, new and better aircraft, stronger and smarter soldiers, still though within a North American discourse of self-improvement and performance. The implicit diagnosis is that humans are creatures who do not perform well enough, and the therapy is to support, improve, and extend our bodies and brains so that we get healthier, live longer, and perform better. In the words of the late computer and cognitive scientist Marvin Minsky, and this is actually a real quote for those who wonder, we ought, we ought to be more insistent about improving our brains and our bodies. I find it annoying that we have to live only a hundred years just because of a few evolutionary mistakes. When we design new forms for ourselves, we will describe our intentions along with the plants. What is characteristic though for promissory research and innovation policy discourse is the ambiguity or rather slalom zigzagging between fiction and reality. One refers to an imagined mind-blowing future and then next to a more modest technology that already exists, for instance, electronic prosthetics. I've experienced this ambiguity many times. Synthetic biology and precision medicine are two other examples. The way the promissory discourse works is to draw normative justification from the utopian imaginary for instance, a wonderful life when precision medicine can control all disease. And when this is criticized for being unrealistic, empirical plausibility is drawn from some more modest technological application that actually exists, such as a nanomolecule that facilitates better drug delivery, or a molecular test to find a cancer drug with fewer adverse effects. In this way, proponents of such imaginaries argue that they are desirable, and at the same time plausible or even inevitable. The net result is a technological imperative that is technological optimism and technological determinism combined. Or, as is sometimes exclaimed, with, a, with little sense of irony, I believe, the future is already here. And I'll see if I can blank the screen. A lot has been written about the difficulty I couldn't really, but that's, that's okay. A lot has been written about the difficulties of critically appraising socio-technical imaginaries and subjecting them to ethical deliberation. The technological trajectory is presented by its proponents as desirable and good itself. And ethics is relegated to handling the nuisance of possible adverse effects or counter-arguments. Critique of the utopian visions can be dismissed as speculative ethics that engages in unrealistic fantasies. And on the other hand, the modest use cases are often construed around an obvious case of suffering and goodwill. 
who could be against giving an innocent child a smart prosthetic leg or a tailored cancer therapy. In the real modest case, the counter arguments might be few and weak, perhaps related to an implausible scenario of misuse or a vague risk of a slippery slope. In both cases, the wider ramification of the technology might be understood only after it's implemented in practices and infrastructure, and by then it may be too late to reverse the development, too late to pull the plug, as it were. I would like to emphasize the presence of goodwill. I've spent 35 years in the university world, together with medical and natural scientists, first as a student of science myself, and later as a researcher who does his research on science. I met good people who work hard and do their very best to advance scientific knowledge, perhaps to satisfy your own curiosity, but almost, almost invariably also with the aspiration to help mankind. In a world where cruelty exists, as we were reminded in the opening words, where some people deliberately seek to harm others, it is important to recognize the presence of goodwill as that which I find ubiquitous among scientists. Natural scientists and technologists tend not to see well, however, how their own intentions and imaginations of what mankind needs or could benefit from are shaped and limited by dominant imaginaries and ideologies, as well as the deeper institutional structures of the societies and cultures to which they belong. This is not what they have been trained for. Ethical deliberation together with them can be painful for all, especially if people like myself forget to explicitly acknowledge the good intentions. There certainly is a place for ethical deliberation in close interaction with techno-scientific practices. The latter 60 years, ethics has proliferated as a profession and as a skill, not the least because of the many dilemmas and paradoxes that emerge with modern medicine. Modeled over practices in clinical ethics, a type of research ethics emerged where individual research projects are subject, subjected to scrutiny by ethics boards and committees, a type of casuistry partly grounded in national and international ethics regulations and guidelines, such as the, the Declaration of Helsinki and the Oviedo Protocol. In my experience, ethics approval does contribute to better protection of research subjects and the right to privacy, integrity, and dignity during the research process itself. Furthermore, since the 1990s, numerous ethical and legal frameworks have been made to regulate the acquisition, use, and storage of human biological material and personal data, both on the national and the international level, for example, in the Council of Europe, there are initiatives to update and strengthen such frameworks to accommodate the particular ethical challenges raised by converging technologies. And yet, the sensation I wish to share with you as a scholar and practitioner is that of ethics lagging behind the technological development and, if anything, reifying it. Ethics are conceived in the form of review boards and guidelines may prevent certain harms from taking place during the research process itself. However, it is neither able to nor equipped with a mandate to shape the research projects or agendas themselves. The space for ethical deliberation is mainly limited to the duration of the research project and not to the societal implications of the outcomes of the research. Ethics review boards are not able to govern science and technology towards the common good. Current practices of research ethics and play regulative and not constitutive roles. This observation is neither original nor novel. Hence, in parallel with the strongly promissory discourses on converging technologies and technoscience in general, one also finds an undercurrent in research and innovation policy that searches for models of governance of science whereby ethical and societal concerns could be better incorporated into the shaping of the research agendas in the first place. We have already noted how research agendas are co-produced with socio-technical imaginaries of desirable future scientific, technological, and social orders. But whose desires get to be expressed in these visions? As a matter of empirical fact, 
the visions are mostly created and shaped by scientific, economic, and political elites in affluent societies. Not surprisingly, high prestige techno-scientific advancements often address real or imagined needs of these elites, adding more health, well-being, and luxury to those who already had quite a lot of it. One aspect is what already 25 years ago was coined as the 10-90 gap, that is, that only a small portion of the resources for health research is devoted to the overwhelming share of the global burden of disease. Calls have therefore been made to democratize research agenda setting, to include, or rather to stop excluding, voices from the peripheries of these elites. By incorporating their needs and concerns, one could hope to arrive at research agendas that are more inclusive, equitable, and just. Within the European research area, this line of thought is connected to the policy princi principle of responsible research and innovation, or RRI for short. In 2012, RRI was made a cross-cutting principle of the European Union's eighth framework program for research and innovation, the so-called Horizon 2020 program. Unfortunately, the principle is fading out of EU policy again. It would be a lecture of its own to explain why. I will for now simply state that it's intrinsically difficult to defend a policy created to make space for peripheries within political institutions that constitute their own elite. This is not just simply a question of power. It's also a question of what is perceived as rational and reasonable from within the institutions. And these two questions of power and rationality are intrinsically linked. This is another way of saying that peripheral perspectives are called for, not only for their own sake, but for the sake of the common good. I will proceed to indicate what is at stake in the development of converging technologies by myself zigzagging between imaginaries and realities, while adopting perspectives that perhaps are at angles from the dominant one in official research and innovation policies. First, unless one believes in trickle-down economics, there is little reason to expect that converging technologies, as they are presently governed, will benefit the underprivileged in particular and contribute to equity and greater social justice. The political economy of technoscience isn't oriented in that way. It's governed to fuel innovation and economic growth in leading economies and primarily addresses or constructs demands among those with high purchasing power. In the same way, while bio and nanotechnology, ICTs and artificial intelligence might prove useful to our challenges of sustainability and the degradation of the natural environment, this has at least so far not been the main focus of attention for converging technologies. In particular, the European Union has through its so-called Green Deal invested strongly in the belief that technological innovation can lead to a decoupling of economic growth from resource use and thereby solve the challenges of sustainability. I believe that this belief is not well supported by science. More should be said about these issues of equity, social justice and sustainability. For the remainder of my lecture, however, I would like to focus on another issue. I would like to discuss the ramifications for the human condition in societies that may afford and acquire converging technologies. In our 2015 report to the Committee on Bioethics of the Council of Europe, my colleague Matthias Kaiser and myself argued for caution. In particular, we warned that converging technologies may pose threats to human identity and dignity by offering new instruments for covert persuasion and personality alteration. Such threats are not hard to imagine when one reads transhumanist visions of connecting brains or genetically modifying humans to change the morality of the species. In these utopias, dystopia is somehow already implicitly present. There is no need to resort to science fiction, however. In 2014, Facebook researchers published results from the so-called emotion contagion experiment, and I show the paper here from PNAS in which they set out to show that they could manipulate the emotional states of some 700,000 
unknowing uses by adjusting the newsfeed algorithm. Since then, covert mass manipulation by social media companies has become everyday news and a challenge to democracy. Another example of actuality is deep brain stimulation where electrodes are implanted into the brain to change its electric activity. While this is a powerful technique in the treatment of neurological conditions, such as Parkinson's disease, it is also known to collaterally influence personality in diverse ways. Currently, this happens uncontrollably and seemingly at random. I find it plausible, though, that with more research, one could achieve better control over personality change by such means. What will then happen to dissidents in the prisons of authoritarian states? Is it always going to be necessary to do surgery to plant such electrodes? Or could one imagine a wireless, non-invasive alternative that allows for tailored personality alteration? In the dominant socio-technical imaginaries in research and innovation policy, there has been a tendency to take for granted that the world moves towards more democracy and a higher respect for human rights. I think we all can agree that this is naive and possibly a dangerous belief. Beyond such sinister issues, I've come to believe, however, that we also should discuss seemingly innocent and mundane technological applications in the light of Laudato Si and the question of the technocratic paradigm. Depending on our exact line of demarcation between science and other forms of knowledge production, most or all of science objectivates. It defines, studies, and thereby facilitates manipulation of objects. Also, psychology and social sciences objectivate man and thereby change the human condition. What is so special about converging technologies is the power with which they bear promise to objectivate both human bodies and minds, and the interplay between body and mind. In Humana Comunitas, Pope Francis rightly calls these developments epochal changes. This is a larger issue than the risk of authoritarian governments or multinational companies abusing technology without being held accountable. It is larger because the change takes place unintentionally and in the presence of goodwill. What is missing then? If the paradigm is one dimensional, which dimensions are missing? There is no need for me to educate the academy in that regard. The spiritual dimension is missing. The understanding that the human body and mind is not just an arbitrary collection of genes, cells, and tissues is missing. Boundaries are missing. The composition of the human body and mind has become a question of unbounded creativity where everything might be changed. Our set of organs, our senses, our biological sex, our personality traits. For some, all of this is justified if we perform better, become better workers, citizens, better soldiers. Others will see it as a matter of individual utility and of optimizing health, longevity, well-being and comfort. And beyond both, there is the perceived need to stimulate economic growth through innovation. The one-dimensionality of the paradigm consists in pursuing technological trajectories that optimize measurable, objectifiable features and in considering living systems and human beings accordingly in mere quantitative terms. What is counted, counts. A medical treatment constitutes progress if it is shown by statistical methods to extend the average quality adjusted survival by three months. Whether the treatment happened to have side effects that made it difficult to live and die with dignity those months is, as it were, an unscientific question. Within this kind of logic, a deadly disease should always be fought by any means. Every death is a defeat. Paradoxically, it is in some of the technologically advanced affluent societies that euthanasia has become officially endorsed. In the Netherlands, for example, 80% of those who ask for medical euthanasia are cancer patients. Is this phenomenon a kind of perverse effect of hypermedicalization? First, the technocratic paradigm gives longevity, primacy over human identity, dignity, and flourishment. Next, the same paradigm tries to solve its problems 
the problems it created itself by means of another technical fix. And all of this takes place in societies where novelty has become a cultural value and a driving force for, for, for consumption. The governments install policies to increase the innovation rate, and we should expect more of these paradoxes to emerge. What can we do? At one point in his writings, Marquis de Condorcet asked a pessimistic, Malthusian-like question. He answered the question himself optimistically. Humanity was entering an epoch of scientific progress, and Marquis de Condorcet found itself evident that automatically there would be corresponding moral progress. I believe he was wrong. Processes of scientific, moral, and spiritual progress are not by necessity coordinated. And we seem, seem to live in a time where scientific and technological progress is the faster. There are more ways to be an optimist. I believe that we should not ask for quick fixes. Indeed, the desire for a quick fix belongs to the technocratic paradigm itself. It is part of the problem. It may take generations for societies to acquire the wisdom to govern technoscience for the common good and for human flourishment. Mistakes may have to be made, but this is how humanity learns, by trial and error. In the world of politics and policy, policy making, the awareness of the problem is marginal, but arguably growing. I mentioned the concept of RRI, of responsible research and innovation. Earlier, already in 2003, and in response to the transhumanist flavor of the American NSF report on converging technologies, the European Commission appointed a high-level expert group to craft an alternative, and it's mentioned in the invitation to the workshop. Their report recommended an approach along the lines of, of this workshop, namely to focus on the value dimension in processes of technological convergence. It argued that ethics, human rights, and social empowerment should be placed at the core of research agenda setting. I think it is a fair verdict that this report did not, to, did not come to play a major role in EU policy. But 20 years then is not a lot for a paradigm change. Within academia, we can improve our ways to describe, perhaps even count, what currently does not count. Medicine and health science can become sensitized to a wider range of meaning, including the spiritual dimension. We can do better than counting months of so-called progression-free survival. For ICTs, we could quantify more, not only computing power and bandwidth, but we could also measure the effect on children when they in vain trying to catch the attention of their parents who constantly are checking their phones. We could build a science for human flourishment. This might be easier than some expect. A lot of knowledge is already there, also outside the scientific, economic, and political centers of power. We could listen better to peripheral voices, or even better, they might become louder. And they might become stronger for a number of reasons, including that the functioning of the sophisticated technologies that we're discussing actually depend on the functioning of expensive infrastructure and heavy use of natural resources. So some of problems of the rich may simply disappear by themselves, especially when our societies are so extremely unsustainable. The world of converging technologies is reminiscent of a brave new world, not necessarily totalitarian, but totalizing its discourse. Let me end where I began by thanking the Academy for organizing this workshop and for continuing to bring up these issues. In the long term, I believe in moral progress. The path may be long and winding though, especially if critique and dissent fade away. Windows to different perspectives should not be closed. We should continue to ask how technology may converge on the person and insist on converging the person as more than an isolated individual, a subject that only controls or is controlled, disconnected from everything that is larger than oneself in blind suspense between heaven and earth. We should ask at every crossroads, can this or that socio-technical trajectory help us remember how our lives truly can be and support our strengths to live them? Thank you for your attention.
Se volete lasciare, se, vole, se avete qualche domanda le potete scrivere in questi foglietti che possono essere raccolti dalle ragazze. E, e anche sulla chat ovviamente potete scrivere domande brevi. Se ci potete intanto già portare quello che avete, grazie. Possiamo leggerla prima? Uh, I may read uh, some of the questions uh, that we are going to discuss. So the first one is to uh, um, the ethics uh, is not able to, to keep uh, uh, the, the, the velocity and the rapidity of a technology and research. Uh, what do you think about ethical committees ad hoc, so specific? Uh, with uh, com members that are specifically trained in that topic? Or what do you think about ethics commission that evaluate everything with this? And so more general, I think. So specific committees or general committees? Yeah, these are large questions, of course, and I don't pretend to have the ultimate answers to any of them. Um, I wouldn't like you to be left with the impression that I argued that ethics committees are not doing valuable work. I think they do tremendously valuable work, and I also try to as assist on such committees myself. Um, the valuable work they can do is often connected to, as I said, ad hoc to the, uh, to the project itself in some cases, and, uh, and of course also in, in terms of guidelines. The problem, however, is the institutional space that is given to an ethics committee within research ethics or science ethics. So, um, although the idea that, you know, we could have an ethics committee that would have a complete mandate, as it were, to consider all normative aspects and be given a full mandate to make decisions over the research. But at that moment, that ethics has become politics. Um, and it's probably a type of politics that we wouldn't like to have, which is to destroy the science. So, so, in order for science to exist, it has to have autonomy as well, to some degree. <laughs> so, so, there is no quick fix to this. There is, um, on one hand, we know what happens with societies if we try to make all of its science politically correct or ethically correct. That is a sure way into dictatorship and authoritarian states. On the other hand, we are in the situation where Technology is, is indeed a runaway train, right? So, so, and it's runaway in the sense that we don't know exactly, we don't have the knowledge to govern science and technology well yet. I would guess it takes another two, three hundred years to have that knowledge. <laughs> but uh, we may disagree on that, yeah? Um, that was probably an answer that was far too long already, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another question, I, I just summarize. Should the industries have moral responsibility in the designing of policy access to high price, drug, price drugs? Yes, the industries should have moral responsibility. Moral responsibility, industries, yeah. industries. Moral responsibility in the designing of policy access to high price drugs. And I guess I can say what I think about that. <laughs> um, why do we as a society at all allow that some medical treatments are so expensive? Um, I was a, I, 
I am not an expert on economics, so I was in the illusion for many years that the reason why some medical treatments are so expensive is their production costs and their uh, innovation costs. And I've been taught by health economists that this is really the case. It's market price. So when they are very expensive, it's because there is a market of customers, if you wish, and in Europe that is normally states, it's, uh, it's wealthy states, that accept a type of economic setup whereby we have to pay these prices, which then of course means that other, in other places of the world there will be no access to these drugs. The problem of asking the companies for moral responsibility in this case is, well, we may do so, but if they are, if, they, if the companies are owned by their shareholders, they have a legal obligation to maximize profit. So, this system works within what we can rightly call capitalism. And within that capitalist, capitalist setup, we will have this, we will have this phenomena, basically. It's a political problem. I have some other question. Uh, so, uh, what do you think about giving voices uh, of a poor people in front of emerging technologies? I would strongly support it. First of all, it would be very much in line with the policy principle of responsible research and innovation that I mentioned. It would be in line with the call for transdisciplinarity that we've heard twice already today. And yeah, the, of course we can do so, but we have to we have to keep attention on the economic structures at the same time, because it's not enough to give voice to the less affluent. But somehow, when it comes you know, to the, uh, to the trans technological transfer from science to technology, there has to be a business model. Otherwise, the, the technology can't be developed. So it has to be accompanied with the political and economic measures so that these needs and concerns can be translated into um, into products and, and services. Yeah. Okay. I have some other questions. Uh, so I just try to summarize and uh, um, what is your opinion on uh, the so-called anthropological and ontological turn? Uh, uh, in front of emerging technologies, and uh, uh, what do you think about uh, the concept of givenness of human nature? What is given by human nature? And what do you think is this relationship be between what we make through technologies and what is given by nature on the ontological point of view? This is also a profound question. <laughs> I hope we get to discuss it. Um, one thing I learned from studying Hannah Arendt's treatise on the Second World War is something that I hadn't thought so much about. We may think of, we may think of certain aspects of the human condition as given, as unalienable, and then there may happen a political and technological condition that makes us understand that it, it indeed was possible to destroy. So one of the examples that have been made along the lines of Hannah Arendt is that after the Second World War, there were survivors from the concentration camps who could not remember their own names or that they had had the name. So what is given is perhaps something that, even if it is given, we have to defend it. I think that is my answer to that question.
Other question is, uh, uh, when you evaluate a research, uh, you need to evaluate the scientific merit of the research, but also the positive social impact. What do you mean with positive social impact? And who decides positive social impact? So let me start by taking a descriptive turn. So for instance, if we look at how research project money is awarded in the European Union in the Horizon Framework programs and in many national research councils, they would typically score the projects on, as you said, scientific merit. They would score it on the originality and novelty of the ideas of the of the proven competence of the people involved to carry out the project, of course. And then they, they would typically also score it on impact. So how is that impact criterion, um, how is it shaped? Well, if you go to the horizon or to the framework programs of the European Union, innovation potential is, uh, and the potential for economic growth and more jobs would often weigh a lot, right? So if it does so, that becomes equated with societal impact. Of course, it's possible to imagine another regime where you would say, and, and these regimes have existed both within the European Union, and I'm sorry for being so Eurocentric in examples, but this is what I know a little bit about. And also in my own home country of Norway, where the impact criterion has been evaluated on, for instance, the potential for increasing the sustainability of our country or our economy or of, of the, our production and consumption practices. This is totally possible. This can be done. The problem, however, is again that if we're talking about basic research, it's often very difficult to assess this because the whole idea of basic research is that you often don't know what you're going to use this for. So this leads me back to my argument about we, we have to continue to develop our knowledge about how to govern things like science and, te and technology. We don't know this well enough to govern as well as we would like to. But to put equity social justice and sustainability into the concrete evaluation criteria for the impact of research in research funding agencies is something that can be done. It's rarely done, but it could be done much more. So that is actually an example of something we can do. Uh, another question, what kind of resistance against the non-countable how can ethics overcome this resistance? I'll risk saying something stupid now in front of people who know a lot about ethics. I think that um, resonance between a utilitarian focus in the ethics and the uh, economic rationality of our political institutions is strong. So perhaps one way of resisting is to carve out the space for other concepts of ethics than the utilitarian one. Um, deontological ethics, virtue ethics, other, other ways of thinking about ethical principles. And I'm saying this humbly now because there are probably 100 people in the room who know this much better than me, but we also have a long workshop in, ahead of us where they may uh, add on this point. The last question is, uh, uh, as Monsignor Paglia said, we need to consider everyone's freedom and needs. Shouldn't this be done considering patient's age? So the needs of a patient according to the age. It means uh, 
minors, neonats, uh, or adults, uh, uh, do you think you need a, a sort of uh, uh, to distinguish the age of the patients uh, in front of the converging technologies? Yeah, let's let me try to avoid to say more stupid things about. This is a very difficult question. It is tricky. It's very tricky. Um, in my own country, there have been attempts of setting ethical criteria for prioritization of health services based on not age, but the severity of the problem. So, so how do we measure that? The, the, the solution that the Norwegian white paper tried out was to say that we can think about not age, but how many years of expected life are we, would, would somebody lose if they didn't receive the treatment? You can see immediately that this leads into a difficult pathway. And yet, and yet we have to somehow deal with the fact that more and more of the very expensive medicine that we have in the global north is these resources are being spent on us during our last year of living. It, I'm not saying that this is wrong, right? But, but it is a paradox. It is a paradox that we have an average lifespan which is increasing or almost in increasing all the time. If we think of our grandparents, the average lifespan was, was clearly younger, at least in my country. And, and yet we are spending more and more on us when we become 90. So it is something that we need to think about, I think. But there is, again, there is no quick fix around this. And whatever way we treat it, we, we must uphold the idea of dignity, I think. <laughs>